Hello, everyone. Um, this week, we will be focusing on the PTAP controller. Um, as far as I remember, last week, uh, we've talked about the root locus function, how we can recreate the plot itself. Uh, we've also touched base on the body plot and some uh, step response uh, plotting, where we uh, plot the impulse response and ramp response. Um, so uh, this week we will be talking about the p-type controller, but uh, we're not going to actually use the root locus plot itself to design the p-type controller. Uh, we will be uh, seeing the polynomial method, where we will design a controller using the polynomial method. And then we will uh, still plot the root locus plot, and we'll talk about how we would have designed it using the um, root locus uh, plot method. So, yeah. That's basically going to be the focus of today. Now, we have a third order system, and we are going to design a p-type controller for this third order system. But before we uh, transition into that, what we have to do is we have to talk about the actual design method uh, using the polynomial uh, method. And then we'll uh, look at this example here. Uh, it doesn't make uh, any difference when you're using the root locus method if you're using MATLAB, because you will plot the root locus plot uh, and then click on a, a certain point and then drag that point maybe to come up with a P-type controller. But of course, not everything is that simple in real life. When you're trying to design it on pen and paper, then it becomes more challenging because you have to uh, look for the angle condition and magnitude conditions, which involve a lot of trigonometric functions. Therefore, it's not uh, that, uh, that easy to use the root locus method on paper. But using the polynomial method might be uh, helpful because it might be more suitable if you're not uh, really good with the trigonometric functions and identities. So, yeah, we'll see. Now... Um, we have talked about the fact that the p-type controller that uh, is basically the easiest and simplest form of a controller, and it is a closed loop feedback structure. So we have a reference and then a summation point, then the controller, then the system, and then the output. If we design it like this, this is called the open loop. But if we have a measurement, uh, when we measure the output, and take the difference between the input and output, then we have this feedback, which is quite important because this gives us information about what's really going on and what we should basically change. Maybe we should adapt to it, increase the control signal here a little bit, maybe decrease it a little bit to match the uh, input and the output of this structure here. And the simplest form of a controller is the P-type controller because it's a static gain. It is just a coefficient, and when you're going to be more simpler than that, then k is just going to be equal to 1, basically. It's a, the most specific uh, p-type controller that you can come up with. In this case, you can look up the uh, closed-loop transfer function. You can calculate the closed-loop transfer function because you know what the controller is, you know what the system is, and then you're good to go. Now, if you're not really that familiar with a feedback structure, you should immediately get familiar with it. But it's quite easy to just work it out like this because we have certain relations. First of all, we have the reference R. We take the difference R minus Y, which is going to be the error because we are looking at a reference tracking problem where the aim is to kind of mimic the input in the output. Uh, we just define the error, which is basically the difference here. And ideally what we want to have is limit time goes to infinity, inf uh, e should tend to zero. That's basically our objective here. So the error should tend to zero. That would mean that r minus y is equal to zero. So y is equal to r. So we can uh, see that the output is basically the reference input. Now here, this infinity is not quite uh, like the mathematical uh, abstraction infinity because, uh, well, if you remember from the mathematic uh, courses uh, that you had before, you might remember the, uh, the RLC circuits where you have a switch which is switched on and off. And the, then there's this phrase like there was 
um, sufficient amount of time uh, after the switch. That's basically the concept of transient state and steady state. And it is quite important in this case too, because when we refer to time tends to infinity, what we're referring to is basically the steady state. It has been so long that nothing basically changes and everything is settled down. It is at steady state. So that is sufficient for us. Maybe that's the, uh, the settling time. A settling time amount of time is... Uh, the minimum time that we uh, require to call it t tends to infinity. Uh, so that's basically sufficient for us. And our aim is to just uh, meet this requirement here. If you don't apply anything, R is going to be the error here. And yeah, that's not going to change if you don't act up on it. So um, yeah, the, the next equation would be then, since our controller is a static controller, it's mm, just a gain u is equal to k times e. And then we have a dynamic equation, which is gs times u gives us basically the output here. Now we can basically take this equation here and plug in uh, this one here. And we know that u is key uh, k times e. So we can plug that in too. And When we just send it over here, we'll get something like this here. Uh, well, maybe we should leave it like the following because otherwise we'll uh, get another transfer function. So let's have R minus Y equals E, but then we know that our equation is basically Y equals GS times U. So we can plug in U equals K E here. So here, and we know that E is R minus Y. So this way we get the uh, input output relation here. Otherwise, the first thing that I've started was going to be the reference and error uh, transfer function. So we don't really want that here. So uh, GS times K times R minus GS times K times Y uh, is going to be the equation here. Then we send this term over here. Then we have this. Then we can factor out y to get basically one plus one plus k times gs is equal to k times gs. Since I'm using a CISO transfer function, I don't really care about the ordering. But if it's MIMO, then you have to work with with an order because otherwise you will mess it up. But here in CISO, it doesn't really matter. So I just don't care about that. So now this is going to be basically y divided by r. This is the transfer function y divided by r. Uh, and this is basically our closed loop transfer function here. So if you don't know the relation right away, uh, which you should be basically, but uh, anyways, uh, you can just work it out. If you do it once or twice, it'll get obvious. Um, let me also remind you that there's a minus sign here. So that's quite important because otherwise it will change. So this is R minus Y equals E and you get this transfer function here. Now this transfer function is called the closed loop transfer function because we have basically a loop and we're closing it. So if K is equal to one, the easiest one is going to be GS divided by one plus GS. Now, naturally the transfer functions or mathematical models are actually uh, tending to be stable transfer functions or stable dynamic systems. Uh, and you can think about uh, uh, the fact that when you apply a certain limited energy to a system, then most of the uh, systems in the real world will just consume energy and you will uh, basically run out of energy. You have to uh, constantly feed the system with energy in order to be uh, keep going or just working with the system. Um, that's not always the case when you have a certain feedback loop here. Here, you're in a bit danger because you might mess up the stability of the whole closed loop system. Uh, naturally, we don't have that in question because we can assume that most of the systems are stable. So GS on its own is probably going to be stable with some exceptions uh, like helicopters, quadcopters, everything that flies tends to be unstable as far as I remember. But most of the systems are stable and you can't mess up with that. 
But when you have a feedback loop, then the possibility arises on its own. So you can come up with a coefficient K or controller K that messes up the stability. At that point, you don't even care about the transients because, well, the system is unstable. And no matter what you apply to the system, the system tends to infinity. So that's quite dangerous. So therefore, we have to take care about stability. The next one is to, uh, on how to choose the controller K so that we can modify the system behavior uh, to what we want from the system. So we will have some requirements of the system or the closed loop. Sometimes it's called settling time. Sometimes it's going to be overshoot. And sometimes it could be rise time, peak time. Some time domain specifications like these are, uh, are used for step type inputs. And these are basically about the transients. So first we will learn how to modify the system's behavior in terms of the transients. But then there's also the possibility where we use the position coefficient and error velocity coefficients. And there's also acceleration coefficients, not that useful, but still something like that, which is for steady state. So there are two types of basically requirements and design specifications. And we will be talking about the transients first because that's the tricky part for now. And when we talk about the settling time of a system, what we mean is that it takes some time uh, for the system, if it's a stable system, to settle down in a certain band, which is 2% for us, which means that if the reference input is a unit step input, input like r equals one over time, then we expect the uh, output of the system to stay in a 2% uh, interval, which is 102 and basically 0.98. So if we are staying in this interval, the first time instant that we enter this interval is going to be basically the setting time. That time instance is called the settling time. So it there's also a 5% settling time, but we most of the time use the 2% one. So uh, you can look up what they look like. Then we also have something called overshoot, which I'm not going to give the direct relation here, but overshoot is basically when uh, Y passes through the value one. If it's greater than or equal to one, the amount of the peak value, which is the maximum value of the transient response, uh, is going to be used for the overshoot. And you know what the value is, y peak minus y divided by y in percentage is going to be overshoot. Um, we have a formula for this one here, and we'll talk about this formula, but it is more important to uh, talk about the fact that for these formulas, you will encounter something like zeta and omega n. And I've talked about this in the last um, lecture, as far as I remember, but we're going to go into detail here. Now, what is zeta, what is omega n, and why do they matter? Why do we use them? That's going to be basically the first part here. So when you have a system that looks like this, or uh, to be more general, it looks like this, um, you are going to choose some zeta and omega n values in order to come up with a transfer function and then try to meet the transfer function with this structure and this resulting transfer function uh, expression. So um, zeta and omega n is actually something that we already know uh, from our algebra class probably. Uh, zeta is here the damping ratio. Uh, you might not know them with these some symbols, but in a minute you'll see that they relate to a certain thing that is well known. Then we have omega n, which is the natural frequency. And the reason why these are so important is that it comes from the fact that we are looking at a s square b s plus c equals zero, which is a second order polynomial. And we know how to solve this for uh, many, many years, probably. We know for a fact that uh, this is going to be minus b plus minus square root of delta, which is basically, and then divided by 2a, of course, here where delta is going to be b squared minus 4 times a times c. So it's all about this. But uh, the definition is going to be a bit different 
uh, when we use zeta omega again, we define the following polynomial, s squared plus two times zeta times omega n times s plus omega n squared. So that's the only difference here. These two polynomials are going to be the same, but when we uh, use zeta and omega n, we talk about the specific polynomial given in line 14, which is this one here. So um, there's a reason behind that, why we just call it zeta omega n and omega n squared, why the coefficients look like this, and we'll see it in a minute. In fact, when we use a, b, c as the coefficients for this polynomial, uh, first of all, we can see a is equal to 1, which is not that important, but let's get rid of a here. And then we can also see that b is 2 times zeta times omega n, and c is omega n squared. So if we plug these in, for example, for delta, we will get basically 2 times zeta omega n. We will take the square of this and then minus four omega n squared because c is that. And we can see that we will get basically four times zeta squared times omega n squared minus omega n squared, where we add also a four here. So, and if we look close to this expression here, we can see that four times omega n squared is going to be the common term. So four times omega n squared, when we factor it out, we can see we have zeta squared here and then minus one. So this is going to be delta here. Um, let me just write it down like this. Now we can see that the sign of delta uh, basically uh, relies on uh, zeta squared minus one because four and omega n squared will always be positive. If, for example, zeta is greater than one, then we can see that this will always be positive, positive times positive, which means delta is going to be positive. So this means that we will dis have distinct roots, distinct real roots, in fact, and we call it overdamped. So we use this pendulum for uh, an analogy here. And uh, we think about zeta as the friction for the pendulum system. And if zeta is too uh, big in magnitude, if it's, for example, two or four or something like that, if it's greater than one, then there's too much friction in this pendulum system and it slows down the pendulum too much. So therefore it is too much damped or over damped for this case. If zeta is equal to one exactly, then we get delta equals zero because zeta squared minus one is going to be equal to zero and zero times something is going to be zero. Therefore, we will have a repeated roots basically. Repeated roots. Of course, again, real roots. Um, and we call them critically damped. And this is basically the slightest amount of friction or the exact amount of friction that we need so that the system is not slowed down, but also doesn't oscillate. So, you know, this pendulum, if you uh, just let it uh, fall, it will directly stop at the middle at its equilibrium point and it will not overshoot. So this is a critical amount of zeta uh, that we talk about, which is the friction. Uh, and therefore, we don't have any oscillation. So this is also an important point. When we have zero, zero zeta one, if it's in the interval between zero and one, then delta is going to be negative, which gives us complex conjugate roots. And this is called underdamped. Of course, the new amount of friction in the pendulum system is not sufficient. So it passes through the equilibrium point. Uh, so we leave, uh, we we let it fall down. It goes through the equilibrium point, which is this one here. It goes here and then comes back, goes forward, goes backwards until it settles down to its equilibrium point. But it takes quite some time. And the amount of friction or damping ratio is quite insufficient. 
uh, where the critical damped one, when we uh, just uh, started the system, the pendulum, it would just right away stop at the equilibrium point. So basically, we have something called oscillations here. And uh, when we talk about oscillations, the, we know that this one here doesn't have oscillations because it right away stops at its equilibrium point. This stops critically there. So for these two uh, zeta values or intervals, we can say that overshoot is zero because we don't have oscillations. So overshoot is going to be zero. But here we will have a certain overshoot because we have an underdamped system where the friction uh, cannot stop the system at equilibrium point, which is an insufficient amount of friction here. Now, um, and it is quite interesting to be able to look at a polynomial and then form a system from this polynomial. Uh, if we would look uh, at a system, that system would look like omega n squared divided by the given polynomial here. And look, I, I can also choose one divided by or certain uh, numerator divided by this polynomial. But when I use it specifically omega n squared, then if you plug in the final value theorem, you can see that the DC gain or the steady state value of this system when you apply step type input is going to be equal to one. Because S times the transfer function times one over S S will cancel each other out. And if S tends to zero for this transfer function here, these two terms will vanish. You will end up in omega n squared divided by omega n squared, which is equal to one. So I think about this system as the ideal closed loop system, even though it's a second order one. If I'm going to propose a system, uh, if it's going to be a second order one, then I'll choose a certain zeta value and a certain natural frequency omega n and then write this, uh, this transfer function down. And this is going to be my candidate transfer function, sort of. Therefore, it's quite important to know the first order polynomial, which I have skipped basically. But you can see that if I would have proposed a first order one, I would just write down p divided by s plus p in order to have dc gain one. Uh, and yeah, this system doesn't overshoot and it takes four divided by p times in terms of setting time to calculate the settling time of the system because we know that the inverse Laplace transform, I Laplace, of this system for step types and step type inputs will give us something like this, um, minus P times T. You can calculate it, by the way, by defining sims S, T, and using gs divided by s because I'm applying step type input. Um, of course, p is also symbolic. It's a real value, we know that. There we go, you can see that we know already that this is going to be the time domain representation of the response, of the step response of a first order system. And we also know that, that e to the power of minus one, for example, is going to be uh, 0.36. And if you calculate it like one minus e to the power of minus one, you will get a drop down to 60%. One more uh, sample, uh, and you get 0.86%. And then it will rise up to 0.95%. Now, I've talked about the fact that the settling time is going to be calculated when we have the interval, when we first enter the interval uh, 0.98 and 102. Then we will get the setting time formula that we will use most of the time. But if you use 5%, this would be then the time instant. You would use 3 divided by P in order to get the 5% setting time. But if you use one more sample, which is going to be 4, you can see it is 0.9817. And since this is a first order system, it will never overshoot because it doesn't have the complex conjugate part. So, and you can see that this uh, solution here can never overshoot 
it's just going to decay and that's going to be it. There's no sinusoidal. If there's no sine wave, there's no oscillation, there will be, be no overshoot. Um, therefore, we can just use basically four divided by P because we know that the model is like this. At settling time, I want to have 0.98, for example, for this system. Then I know that uh, this is going to be happening for equals four. Therefore, TS is going to be four divided by P. So this is the first order system. You can also come up with the rise time formula because uh, you have E, just use the calculator or MATLAB to see uh, where this rise time occurs, and then you can just model that. Overshoot, there will be no overshoot. It's always going to be zero. And that's basically it. And if you propose, if I would have proposed a first order system for any system uh, as the closed loop, uh, transfer function, then it would look like this, and I would choose a, a fitting pole P that fits my settling time or rise time or whatever. So, uh, and the equivalence uh, in the second order is going to be by choosing zeta and omega n. For the first order system, you have just one parameter, the only pole that you have. But for the second order, you will have basically two parameters that will uh, give you the behavior that you're looking for. And here, the zeta uh, parameter will be for overshoot. Do I want to have some overshoot? Do I want to have zero overshoot? Uh, then I have to choose from these cases here. Um, yeah. So let's continue. We know that B is 2 zeta omega n. And if I plug this in, and if I also plug in this value here, I can see what the solution will look like. Now, immediately I can see we have four omega n squared. I can make that two omega n. And you can see that these two, these coefficients here will vanish. And I will end up eventually in this one here. I guess one parenthesis is too much here. There we go. Now, this doesn't look like the case that I'm mostly interested in namely the underdamped one, because overdamped uh, systems are not really uh, used that much for closed loop transfer functions because it becomes too slow. It is overdamped. There's too much friction for the pendulum system. It takes uh, more time than expected for the system to uh, hit the equilibrium point. So this is not a good choice for systems most of the time, depending upon the system, of course. But we will not be focusing on a zeta greater than one. So that's one thing. Because our settling time formula doesn't work for this. So we cannot uh, predict the settling time of the system. So we are not using them that much. Critical damped, we still have no settling time formula for this or our settling time formula will also not work for this critical damped case, but you can still use it if you're trying to uh, use critical damped uh, as closed loop for most of the time. Um, but mostly when we are talking about classical controller design, then we're talking about uh, zeta between zero and one. And by the way, I didn't talk about the fact that zeta could be equal to zero, now, it becomes obvious that if this is zero, delta is zero, um, then we have basically almost the case where we have the repeated real roots. But since zeta is zero, this one vanishes too, and we get basically no, um, no real part here. And if zeta is zero, we get minus one, then we have basically poles at the j omega axis, or we will just have pure imaginary roots. And if you have pure imaginary roots, uh, then you will end up in a sine wave or oscillations. But since zeta is equal to zero, since there's no friction in the pendulum system, when you uh, start a system, it will uh, swing to both sides forever and ever. Because there's no friction, it doesn't lose any energy, the potential energy is uh, preserved, basically, the total energy doesn't decrease, and a system has basically constant energy, it will go on forever. Th that's also why I use zeta, when you have friction, you know that uh, at least the potential energy will be less than the initial one, because there's friction, and friction will use uh, some energy of the system, so that's why we settle down here. 
so if zeta is equal to zero, we're at marginal stability because some stability definitions take the bounded energy uh, and we call it marginal stability because it's sort of stable in the fact that it doesn't tend to infinity. It is bounded in like minus one and one. It stays between this interval. But yeah, at any if anything happens to the system, it might tend to infinity immediately or the oscillations might grow. So it's kind of dangerous when we have a marginal st stable system. But that's the stability margin uh, which we talk about most of the time of course if it's a sine wave if it's not that if it's just a pure integrator for example it's not stable because it will not stay constant it will give out a ramp response yeah now um we know that this real part here will arise in the inverse of plus transform and we will get times t and you can look it up uh, in the book of ogata in the control system design book uh, by the author Ogata, as far as I remember. And there's a proof for this, but the proof basically is about the fact that the other terms will contribute to the sine wave. So the sinusoidals, we don't really look at them. We just look at this decay rate here, and the decay rate can be just directly calculated by the same mentality which we've used for the first order system. We need four samples uh, to... Um, basically get the settling time. Therefore, our settling time for, uh, formula will look like this. So that's basically the mentality behind that. Uh, overshoot, I'm not going to talk about overshoot for this um, lesson, but we will be looking at the overshoot formula in the future. So, and now, of course, I have to also rearrange this one here because I'm interested in this interval, 0, 1. So I'm going to multiply this with minus one so one minus uh, uh zeta squared and then i'll have square root of minus one so i didn't change anything but i know that this is basically i so i can look at the solution of my polynomial now this is the exact solution of the polynomial i can see the roots here and i can plug in the zeta omega n values in order to uh, get the direct calculation here now, here we can see that 1 minus theta squared, if theta is less than 1, because it is less than 1 and greater than 0, this will contribute to a real value. This is a real value, so I get the imaginary part of this. And this will also be the real value of the poles. And yeah, we're basically ready to go. If for some reason this part becomes negative, 1 minus theta squared becomes negative, that might happen for the overdamped uh, case, then there will be another square root minus 1, and square root minus 1 times square root minus 1 will just vanish, and you will have real distinct root, uh, roots at this point. So, uh, yeah, when I look at a second-order polynomial, I can directly switch to zeta omega n and talk about the system's behavior because I know how it will affect the system. Just by thinking about the pendulum example, you can work your way out in uh, commenting on the system's behavior. And when you are going to design a system or a controller for a system, then you will just use basically zeta and omega n in order to choose the right poles for the right behavior, because we need a certain uh, connection between the polynomial and the behavior and settling time and overshoot, for example. It's not quite easy when you don't use zeta and omega n because there's no direct link there. But if you think about zeta, omega n, I have natural frequency, I have the settling time formula, I will have an overshoot formula where I calculate zeta directly from. I can come up with zeta and omega n pairs that will basically um, meet my specifications or requirements of setting time, overshoot, rise time, peak time, whatever. And then I can use these zeta and omega n values in order to form a second order polynomial. Once I've done this, I need to look at the connection, get the characteristic polynomial of this, and then I'm going to basically try to equate these polynomials in terms of coefficients. Once I've done that, I will solve for the controller for everything that is unknown, and then I will hopefully be happy about the design. So what happens before I uh, start designing controllers, what happens if you have a third order polynomial? We know for a fact that if you have a second order polynomial and a p-type controller, then uh, you will just end up in a second order polynomial because the, sy the, the system is 
second order, the controller doesn't add any dynamicness to it, so it will stay it to be a second order transfer function in a closed loop. But what happens if you start with a third order system, a fourth order system? Uh, I have to note that if you have zeta and omega n, and if we are talking about zeta and omega n, I can only form a second order polynomial that looks like this. And I cannot do anything else. Uh, and we're basically stuck at this point. The only solution that we can come up with is called the dominant pole placement. So the best I can do is to um, place poles and uh, if necessary, also zeros far away from this polynomial uh, roots, basically, or the poles of this polynomial. I know that the real part here is, for example, minus theta omega n and omega n times square root of minus theta uh, squared. So this is the real part. This is the imaginary part. Uh, the best uh, thing that we can do is to hope to be further away on the left, on the S domain, on the left half plane, uh, for the uh, poles that we are going to add, or the zeros. Because the reason behind that is the following. When you have a system that has some slow parts to it and fast parts to it, it wouldn't matter uh, because it would behave like the slow parts of the system. And by that, I mean the following. If you have, for example, two exponential terms and you're basically, uh, let's say, add them together. Uh, if you have minus T, where uh, pole is going to be one and minus 10 times T. So the amount of time that it takes to vanish this part here is so small we know that it should be equal to 4 so at 0 0.4 t equals 0 0.4 we can basically assume that the system is behaving like this because the other term has vanished that's what i'm trying to say here we have this is uh, this part here which is quite fast or further left on the uh, s domain and if we plug in point 0.4, this term already vanishes, whereas this term is still present here. So therefore, what we can do is we can just place some faster poles or zeros additionally to our second order polynomial, and the system will hopefully behave like our system uh, with the zeta and omega n that we have here. So that's the mentality uh, behind this. And we will talk about this. Uh, so, yeah. I have to note uh, two things about the solution, and then I'm going to design the p-type controller because numerical part is more exciting than this part here. So what happens, for example, if I look at the magnitude of this, the magnitude of S, because this is S1 and 2, this is the solution here, S1, 2 is equal to this one here. So what happens if I look at the magnitude? Well, the magnitude is calculated by the real parts square plus the square of the imaginary part and then the whole square root. Before I uh, write down the square root, let me just write it down like this. So this would become basically zeta squared omega n squared plus omega n squared and then square and square root will cancel each other out, we will end up in 1 minus zeta squared, which is going to be looking like zeta squared omega n squared plus omega n squared minus zeta squared omega n squared. Now I can see that these terms, this one and this one, will cancel each other out, and we will be left with omega n squared. So the magnitude of s is going to be omega n. And if you think about this, we know that S is the S domain, and we can write down S as sigma plus J omega. And you will see that this is going to become sigma squared plus omega squared equals omega n squared, which is a known uh, geometric shape, uh, namely the circle at the origin 
So it means that where the radius is omega n. So if we have a certain constant omega n value, if we fix the omega n value for this polynomial, all the roots will be on a unit circle uh, times the radius omega n. If omega n is equal to one, it will be the unit circle, or it will be the circle with radius omega n. So that's quite nice to know. And if we have some omega n uh, plots for different constant omega n values, we will have circles with different radiuses. So that's going to be one thing. What happens if we look at the angle or the tangent, basically? So let's look at a tan, and if you're in MATLAB, a tan d for degrees. Well, that will be the imaginary part divided by, so a tan, this part divided by zeta times omega n. And you can see that omega n is both on the uh, in the numerator and the denominator, so they will cancel each other out, and you will be left with the following, the square root, of one minus theta squared divided by theta here. So that's going to be theta or the angle, angle of S basically. And yeah, this is something that we already know. Just for quick help, I'm going to bring up paint and I'm going to just have a, let's say, triangle. So let's have this one here, and then also this one here, and then this one. So um, we have theta here. So let's have the angle theta here. There we go. Um, and we know that the tangent of theta is going to be square root so square root of one minus theta squared. And then we have theta here. That's basically it. Now, if you look at uh, the hypotenuse here, that would be one minus theta squared plus theta squared, the square root of that, which is basically just going to be one. Now, it is possible to do the following. So that's basically a rectangle here. Um, it's possible to directly calculate zeta trigonometrically, which is basically the cosine here, because zeta divided by one is the cosine theta. So what you can do is you can just use cosine of theta uh, and that's going to be equal to zeta. And that's basically it. So these relations are sometimes quite handy. And that's the reason why we uh, looked at it uh, here. So this is no uh, random thing actually here, but we can just take the imaginary part, divide it into the real part, calculate the angle, and then cosine theta will give us basically the zeta value here. And we can also conclude the following. If we have a certain zeta value, if it's fixed, then you will just get a value here, which is going to be fixed. And it would mean that on the S domain, you're fixing theta or the angle of S. So that's going to be basically a line with a certain slope. And that's it. So if we are on the S domain, we can use the Cartesian coordinates, which is going to be minus theta times omega n, the sigma part and then omega d, which is the damped frequency sometimes called, and that's omega n squared of one minus theta squared. Or you can use the polar coordinates, which is in terms of omega n as the radius, and theta as the angle here, which depends on zeta. So zeta and omega n is basically the polar coordinates or relates to the polar coordinates, coordinates of poles. So it's another way of viewing the S domain, and which is quite important, in my opinion, to know. We most of the time just focus on the Cartesian parts, but uh, there's more data in uh, the, the polar coordinates for the S domain, because we can conclude how uh, the system behavior is going to be based upon uh, the, the um, angle 
for example, because we know that if theta here grows, the cosine will drop down. So if we go up and up in terms of slope, if the slope of the zeta uh, line will increase, zeta itself will decrease. Therefore, we will have more oscillations and the overshoot will increase for a system with that zeta. And omega n times zeta is more important than omega n itself. But still, if we have omega n, if we increase omega n, we're kind of uh, getting a faster response. But still, we have to look at omega n times uh, zeta here. And yeah, that's quite important uh, for both the polynomial methods and for the root locus method to design a p-type controller. And we'll see in a minute how. So let us actually design some controllers to have some numerical ground here. And I'm going to just get rid of everything here and try uh, start clean. So let's design the controller. Let's define our system like this. So um, the system is S, S plus five, or the system poles are uh, five, zero, and eight. There we go. Now, uh, when you're defining a TF object like this, uh, you can go ahead and calculate the coefficients, multiply these uh, this, these poles here or these polynomials here. But I don't really like that approach. What I like to do is I like to use convolution uh, because convolution of vectors basically corresponds to multiplication of polynomials. So what we can do is we can just provide one and zero one and five and one and eight to create the same, same transfer function. Of course, you can also use ZPK. If you use ZPK, uh, you just provide the zero, which is there's no zero at all. So you have to provide an empty vector. And then the poles, the poles are zero minus five minus eight, because these are the poles themselves. Uh, and then gain one, for example. That could be the alternative, but I don't really use that too much. I rather like to use the coefficients here. And if you use the convolution, let me show you what the convolution here gives. It gives 1, 13, and 40. If you would write down s plus 5 times s plus 8, you would get these coefficients. And if you do it like this, you can see 1, 13, 40 is going to be the result. And if we define it like this, we should see basically the same here. Yeah. Uh, of course, it doesn't show us directly what the coefficients are. Maybe simplify fraction could help us out. Or it might also fail. Simply by fraction. There we go. It doesn't really do that much. Maybe collect S could be it. Yeah, that does it. And we can see that these have basically the same expression. So that should be right. Now let's define our controller and then our closed loop transfer function here. And then we can use PZS, PCS in order to decompose it into its numerator and denominator. So let me stop there. So let's run this. And we can see that the closed loop transfer function looks like K divided by SQ plus 13S squared plus 40S plus K. Now, the problem is uh, the following. How can we choose K so that we have a certain setting time? And we don't talk about the overshoot for today. So the only requirement that we have is to have four seconds of setting time. So it, you can see that it's not that easy to see the direct link between four seconds of setting time and this polynomial here, because we have to come up with the value for k in such a way that we get, for example, zeta times omega n a certain value. And we have a third pole, which we don't know what we have to do with. And then we try to end up in the setting time value. I wrote down PZS and PCS for the following reason, by the way, because mathematically we denote 
the polynomials with P, and then this sub-index Z corresponds to the zero polynomial, and then S is our variable, so PZS is going to be the same here. And if we use PCS, that corresponds to the characteristic polynomial, the denominator of a certain transfer function, and C stands for characteristic, P is polynomial, S is our variable. You might also see something like E, which is used most of the time for the residue polynomial. And then we also have PDS. That's most of the time our desired polynomial, which is formed using zeta and omega n, that second order uh, polynomial that we've written down before. Uh, so yeah, I, I keep the naming conventions. I also keep in mind that if I use one S in my variable for the transfer function, it's going to be a TF object. I can apply step, uh, root locus, whatever on it. But if I'm using the symbolic toolbox, it's going to be GSS. Now at this point, we are stuck with PCS. We cannot do much to it. But what we can do is we can write down our setting time formula, which is going to be four divided by zeta times omega n. And that's basically it. And our settling time is going to be four. That's given. And yeah, that's basically it. We, we don't know what zeta is. We don't know what omega n is. But we know that they are real values and also positive. But for now, we can define them like real in order to avoid some unwanted cases that might arise. Because uh, imaginary zeta doesn't make sense. Imaginary omega n doesn't make sense. Now, most of the time, when you are designing uh, using the root locus plot, and if you're in a classical exam, then you would not be happy with this problem here because you don't know what exactly zeta and omega n is. You don't know their specific values. You only have a certain relation here because we can work our way out with the formula here. We know that zeta times omega n, if we switch this with basically ts we get the following and since we know that this is for example four four divided by four is one we know that zeta times omega n should be equal to one their multiplication should be equal to one that's the only information that we have now most of the time there is an overshoot value which directly relates to a certain zeta value when you have uh, overshoot and settling time you can just work out what zeta and omega n is individually but here we don't have that, so we have to stick with the relation itself. But if you remember what PDS looked like, that was S squared plus 2 times zeta times omega n times S plus omega n squared. That is going to be the polynomial that we will write down many, many times. And we can see that the relation zeta times omega n is present here. So we can directly maybe substitute it with a value 1. Of course, this is not that wise to do programmatically, but if you're in an exam, it makes quite sense. Uh, I say that this is not making sense programmatically because I might want to change the value of settling time in order to toy around with the design. Therefore, I want to still use the relation where I work out what the value should be. So what I mean by that is 4 divided by Ts should be here as an expression. And furthermore, what I can do is I can decide on one of the parameters, zeta or omega n, and I can write down uh, it in terms of the other one. For example, if I choose zeta, what I can do is I can uh, send this over here times omega n, and I can get rid of the zeta symbolic definition here. And that should be it, basically. When I do it like this, and if I have two zeta times omega n, I'm just eliminating zeta based on a certain rule, based on the relation that we have. And this will still be the same result that we expect it to be. So let me run it. You'll see that PDS is still s squared plus 2s plus omega n squared. But I have a zeta here. I know uh, what zeta should be, and if ts is going to be changed, it will adapt, basically. So now the problem is the following. We have PDS, our ideal transfer function that we would like to have, but then we have a third-order polynomial which arises from the structure itself. How can we equate these to, uh, to each other? Well, the answer is we can't. We cannot do that because they are, don't have the same order. But what we can do is we can just have another pole, which we really don't care about. 
we only care about P being positive and hopefully being greater in magnitude compared to zeta times omega n. If P is positive, then the polynomial that I'm going to write down S plus P is going to be stable. Since in the closed loop, we will have zeta omega n plus minus j uh, omega n times square root mi one minus zeta square uh, as a complex conjugate pair, we will also have S equals minus P. These three poles will be the only poles present in the closed loop. Now, I know that if I choose omega n and zeta as positive real values, this will be stable forever. But I am not sure about PES, and I will look uh, for the positivity. If it's positive, then S is going to be minus something. So it will be on the left half plane. What I can do now is I can just do the following. Take the coefficients of PCS in terms of S, all the coefficients, and equate all these coefficients to the coefficients of PDS, which is my desired polynomial, times PES in order to match the order of the system, and all. Now, we can basically, we know the fact that if we have a certain polynomial, if we divide all the coefficients of a polynomial to a certain value, it will not change the roots. It will only change the coefficients. And you can revert it back, basically. So that's the reason why we're not basically equating the polynomials themselves but their uh, coefficients because if you do uh, equate them to each other or you will end up in just equating the coefficients here so this could cause some problems but it will not for today so therefore we will be happy with this so let me just show you what the problem looks like like this So what I've done here is I uh, have equated two vectors to each other. And we've talked about the flexibility of MATLAB and how it handles vector operations. Here we can basically get the element by element equation uh, thing, which is going to look like this. And let me just put a semicolon here in order to suppress that. And you can see that the first coefficient of PCS and the first coefficient of this multiplication is one and one is equal to one. The next one is basically 13 equals P plus two. The next one is 40 equals omega n squared plus two P. And the last equation is K equals P times omega n squared. Now you can do this, carry out the operations by hand and you can obtain the same set of equations with calculating the closed loop of the transfer function with the controller given. And by forming this uh, desired polynomial and adding one pole, because we have a third order system, and equating the coefficients. You should be able to do this by hand. Um, here, when you look at the equations, we have a trivial equation, which is trivial because it's an identity, but it might be uh, problematic if we have for example, one equals two or something like that, a false identity here. And the reason behind that is the following. We have S squared plus something and then S plus P. So we have guaranteed that PDS, PS, highest order term will be one because we have basically written down monomials. But here, from the structure, it could be the case that PCS has the highest order term something else than one. Then in that case, we have to take action but for now, we are okay, so I'm not going to confuse you with that. Here, I am indexing the problem because the problem is a vector of equations. I take the ith elements. I use variable precision arithmetic to show them like 40 point something or 2 point something to get a sense of double, uh, which I've talked about in the previous lectures. And then I am using this to just have a tidy output here. So we can basically solve them by just eyeballing it. For example, I can see that P plus two is 13, so P should be 11. And then when P is 11, we get 22. So this should be 18. So 18 times 11 is 198. So I can see that K is 198. Square root of 18 should give us the natural frequency and P is 11. And P is positive, which is quite good. P is 11, which is quite better. Because even though we cannot, we cannot see what zeta times omega n is, I already know that zeta times omega n should be equal to 1. 
So 1 and 11, 11 is far away. So this should basically work. So let's solve it. Let's ask MATLAB to solve it. But you will see that when MATLAB solves this set of equations, since we have this nonlinear term omega n squared, what you can do is you can substitute it with a, another variable, let's say x, then it would look like a linear set of equations. But when you solve that for x, p, and k, you will end up in a unique solution. But then the relation omega n squared equals x will give you symmetric two solutions. And that will basically the case here, um, since we have nonlinearity in our equations. And you can see we have two solutions. But in our solutions, we can see that the k and p values are repeated. And omega n is basically symmetric. It could be positive or negative. Of course, it doesn't make sense if it's negative, because that's not possible by definition. So we need to basically get the values, convert them into double, sol.k, do it the same for p, repeat for p, and omega n. But then we will eliminate based upon the value of omega n val here. So if I do it like this, and keep in mind, P is a symbolic variable, omega n is a symbolic variable, k is also something symbolic, which I didn't write down real for some reason. Uh, these are symbolic variables. I have kind of a um, copy of them uh, or placeholders for them in terms of values. I don't directly use the same variables and I would highly suggest you to do the same because I might want to use sol.k or I might want to use the symbolic variable then I will have lost it when I define it or overwrite it with this conversion here and then use k instead of k val. So I'm going to use placeholders for symbolic variables instead of themselves because I might want to use them over and over again. So when I do this, and when I look at k val, I can see two values, omega n val, I can see one positive and one negative. So I highly suggest you to use a certain variable called index i or something like that and write down omega n val greater than or equal to zero, for example, because this is going to be a logical operation. We have a vector, a logic operator, and then the value, it will be carried out element by element and it will return us a vector and it will give us for example, logic zero for this one, because that doesn't hold, but 4.24 is positive. So we're interested in that. And that one will be logical one or true. So we will get false true. And by that criteria, we will eliminate all the variables because we're not interested in values. For example, K val should be K val, but only the ones that have logical ones or true in them should be present. All the other stuff should be eliminated. you don't really have to create a, um, a variable for this. You might want to just want to substitute this into index, into index, into index, but then the ordering becomes important. You should eliminate the variable in test at last. Otherwise you will not eliminate the other ones. So just if you're confused with this, just use this approach, save it to a variable, then you can check which one you did choose, which one you didn't, and you're eliminating basically based on that. So let's see if it works. Omega n val, k val, p val. We've reduced down to just one solution because this one is the only one that makes sense. What I can do is, by the way, remember that we had this relation here. I can just repeat it here. 4 zeta val equals 4 divided by ts times omega n val. So now I know what omega n val is, what zeta val is, what p val is, and what k val is. So zeta val is 0.23, omega n val 4.24, and I know the rest. Now, sadly, I can see that the zeta value is not that high. Of course, here we don't have that specification, but most of the time we don't want to have this low zeta values because this will correspond to a high value overshoot, high amount of overshoot. And that's not uh, necessarily something that we want. 
but yeah, for this case, we don't really care. It's just the design. But in the practical world, which is uh, quite more difficult than this class, for example, because in this class, sometimes we give you at least some uh, hints or some requirements, specifications, whatever, and you have to search for it and try to design the best controller. In real life, you are also the one who should come up with these specifications and limitations, and then you should also try to overcome them. So it's all on you. Then it becomes more uh, big of a challenge. But yeah, let's go on. Now, I know what the value is. This whole process here, this 33 lines of code, actually was a one click away from us when we had MATLAB and the root locus plot in front of us. If you would have clicked on it, you would just somehow try to guess it and you would end up in this. When you design the controller, because we know that the controller should be 198 as the value, um, you're not quite there. You have to satisfy, you, you have to just plug in the controller, look at the closed loop, look at the step response, look at the pole zero map, and even look at the root locus plot and where you have ended up in order to conclude if it is going to work or not. You have to validate your results. And that's exactly what we're going to do. FS is equal to KVAL. Since we have defined GS, we can use TS equals feedback. FS times GS, comma, one. And then let's create a figure. Let's create a subplot. Let's have them side by side. Let's have hold on, grid on, X label being time. You can use the step function itself, but I'd like to customize my plots. The Y label is should it should be YT. Title should be step response. And then I'm going to save the handle get current access AX1. Now I'm going to create another subplot, which is the second one here. And let's have basically hold on. But I don't think that anything else is going to be necessary. So there we go. Now, y comma t is going to be step and then ts. And we can give it a final value since we have a certain settling time. What we can do is we can say two times the settling time. So we were looking for four, so we could simulate it for eight seconds. Or 1.5, which would be basically six seconds, something like that. You don't really have to provide it, but I'm just going to give it here. Let's have black as the line. Let's increase the line width with two. Maybe we can also have a display name and then maybe create something like TS, num to str, TSE, and then maybe overshoot, num to str, overshoot. So I can acquire these informations from step info and then provide TS and TSE is going to be info dot settling time because info is a struct. You can use the dot operator to access the fields here. Overshoot, there we go. Of course, this belongs to AX1. Now have the root locus here our locus AX2 of GS, the open loop transfer function here. And I'm also going to look for the closed loop poles and zeros. C poles and C zeros. The reason why I prepend the poles and zeros with a C is basically we have a um, zeros function that we use to create zero matrices. Sometimes it's might cause problems because we are using the same name. So I'm avoiding that basically. I'm using PZ map with TS. If you don't have output arguments, it will plot you the pole zero spread or the pole zero map, but I'm interested in only the values, which I can also calculate it by using, for example, TS.numerator and then the roots of that. That's also some way of calculating it like this and then the roots of it. But I like to use PZMAP because it's self-explanatory. And I'm going to plot basically the, um, the poles 
I don't really care about zeros because I know that there are no zeros. So the real value of poles and the imaginary value of poles with kx, so black crosses, have line width of two. And yeah, that seems to be all right. Of course, we have used display names, so we should also have uh, legends of AX1 and show it basically. Otherwise, it will not pop up. We're quite there, I guess. Let's run it. And hopefully, it should create us nice plots. There we go. So this is the design that we ended up in. I'm going to add a one more thing here. I'm going to add a S grid here, a S domain grid, and it will be the polar coordinates here. And I can do it by using S grid here. I provide the zeta value here. And then I can also provide some omega n values. I know that omega n val and p val are some values that I'm interested in here. This belongs to AX2, so let's run it again. So now you can see, hopefully, that there are two uh, half circles here with radius 4.24 and 11. And then we have a line which corresponds to the zeta value 0.236, which is our zeta value. And what I meant by uh, if you're designing the controller on pen and paper, you would not like this problem because it would involve too much trigonometric stuff in its uh, solution, is this uh, the reason why we have basically zeta and omega n, but we don't know the values of them individually. So usually you have the desired point here. You just uh, take the uh, vector from all the open loop poles, and if there are zeros, also the zeros, to this design point, and then you look at their angles, you calculate their angles, and if they sum up to 180, they should be on the root locus. And if you use the absolute um, distances here and then multiply them, you should get the gain 198. That's basically it. But of course, it's not that easy if you don't know at least one of them, like zeta and omega n, you have to have basically, uh, yeah, you can just call this distance zeta times omega n, and then we know that this is one minus zeta squared, square root of that times omega n, and then we have omega n as the vector here. But then you have to calculate from minus five, I believe, to this point, which is going to be a parametric vector, and then also from uh, from minus eight to this point. So it's kind of a struggle if you're using the root locus method. If you know the exact point, for example, if you know that it's 2.236 and 424, then you can just directly calculate the coordinate of this. You know, all the other coordinates, you can just take the difference and look at the vectors, uh, take their angles, take their uh, distances and calculate the controller. So that's not going to be a big deal. But what we are trying to do is here, we are trying to match the exact point that has a certain zeta value and a certain omega n value, and their intersection is exactly the point of interest here. You can see it's a symmetric one. So based on this zeta value and omega n value, we've chosen this pole pair. We added a third pole because of the order of the polynomial, and we didn't really care about it. It should be on the left half plane, and it should be far away. In this case, we know that the multiplication is going to be equal to 1 here, and 11, it's 10 times or 11 times to the left, so it's quite good of a solution. Now, I can also show you something that is called the settling timeline, which is going to be this line here, and we can plot it by using AX2, and we know that the uh, line is going to be at minus 4 divided by Ts. That's the real value of it. Uh, so let me multiply this with times 1s, 1, 1, 2. And then I'm going to give it the y limit, ax2, and then 
a dashed line maybe with line width two. So that should be it here. Uh, I know that the real part here is going to be important. So I'm calculating it like I did it here. So it's basically the same mentality here. But I need to be on the left half plane, so the minus sign is for that. And I have to, to have two values because I'm going to draw a line. And y limit here will return me basically the uh, y limit values of the subplots of here, which is minus 25 and 25 in our case. So let me run it again. And there we go. You can see it passes through this line, which is the setting timeline, which was the only information given to us. So let me zoom in a little bit, maybe. And you can see it goes through, our, through this point. And the only data that we had was basically the uh, x-axis value of this. We don't know what zeta should be. We don't know what omega should be. But we know that their multiplication should be on this line. So that's the only thing that was given. So it's quite a hard example in terms of uh, using the bare root locus method. So now uh, we can see that the settling time value is 3.957, which is quite good if you think about the fact that we were searching for setting time four. And we have a 43.1673% overshoot, which is very, very high, but that was not given to us. So we don't really care. And in terms of the dominance or the dominant pole placement, where I talked about the slow poles being the dominant ones and the fast one being um, the one that doesn't even matter, uh, we are in a good position because the relative distance between the pole pair and this third pole is quite good. It should be at least five times or six times away. So if we have minus one, for example, minus five, minus six is quite a good starting point, but it's better to have, of course, a 10 times factor here. So if it would have been 10, we would have been okay. And if it goes more to the left, it's not really that bad. At some point, we will face some problems if it's a too fast pole, but that's not the case for now. So this is solution one. You can solve it using other methods, but if you use the algebraic method, you can solve it like this. So what I'm going to do is, since the other ones are quite the same, uh, only the setting time changes, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this, paste it, call it run two, for example, uh, change the value of the setting time here, 2.5. That's the beauty of coding it like that. And I'm going to call it the figure two and yeah, that's basically it. We're going to design the second controller. So basically, the question here is to end up in a faster closed loop. What if we speed it up a little bit? So you can see, let me bring them side by side. That was design one. Now we have design two. And let's see. Now, we can see, for example, let me bring it a little bit like that. Now, we can see actually that the ocean value did drop. And there's a reason behind that because this pole at minus five and the pole at the origin, they collide at this point one of them decides to go up like this on this branch, and the other one does the symmetric. But we can see that since they tend to the asymptotes, since we don't have finite zeros, they tend to their asymptotes. Since we have three poles, it would be 60 degrees, negative 60 degrees, and 180 degrees. You can see that there are three asymptotes here, basically. And we can see that on this line, when we go like this, K increases. And since we hit a point that was before this, somewhere here, we have a lower K value for starters. And we can also see since the, uh, uh, see that since the angle is uh, smaller, the zeta value, since we are using the cosine of theta, is higher. So 0.544. 
if zeta is higher, we have more friction for the pendulum system, and we can see that more friction ends up in less oscillations. Therefore, our, uh, our overshoot value did drop down quite significantly, by the way. Um, but our settling time value is not 2.5 exactly. We did hit the spot here with 3957, but that's not the case here. We have a larger um, relative error, if you think about it. Now, why did this happen? Because we did use the same script and we did solve it like we've solved the other one. Now, the issue here is that you can see that the value of the third pole or the magnitude of the third pole is 9.8. And you can also see that the value is not going to be one here. It's slightly to the left. So the relative distance between the third pole and the pole pair is smaller. So in other words, the dominance factor did drop down. We had a very high dominance factor. Therefore, this pole didn't affect our formulas. We did model it like a second order system and we achieved the value almost exactly. But here the relative distance did drop down. Even though it's not the worst, it still uh, affects the system because you cannot deny that 9.8 uh, doesn't affect it. And in fact, it should be four times something, I guess, because four divided by TS in our case now is 1.6. So 9.8 divided by 1.6, the ratio is six. It's a good starting point, but we missed the spot a little bit, but it's not that significant. But if it's going to drop down even further, if it's not six times away or at a point uh, like five times away, then it will become worse. So it will start affecting more and more. So five is a good starting point, but 10 times is uh, like very, very good. It's something relative to the system. But in our case, it seems like the performance of our formulas did drop down a little bit because the um, dominance factor did drop down a little bit. Um, yeah, but we did have a lower K value. And you can see 198 was the first solution. 84.67 is the second solution. So it's a lower gain value. It ended up being a lower overshoot, higher damping ratio, lower dominance factor. But we could be happy with this because, yeah, the only thing that was given was basically 2.5 seconds. We could tweak K a little bit more, maybe higher, maybe lower in this case, to end up in the settling time that we want. We have to tune it a little bit if you want to get exact value uh, here. But if you're in an exam, this is the solution that you should give because uh, if, unless otherwise stated, you shouldn't improve on, uh, on your solutions because this is the theoretical way of designing it. That's it. Of course, you can come up with better results if you have numerical tools available or MATLAB available. But in classical sense, you should stop here. Otherwise, it will be stated and maybe uh, you're asked uh, about it. You can answer it. But this is basically the textbook uh, solution of this uh, problem. Now, I'm again going to copy and paste it, which is quite nice. If you think about it, we don't code it over and over again. We could turn it into a function, but that's not the uh, focus here. So therefore, I'm not going to do it. The third design challenge here uh, asks us to create a critical damped closed loop, which is not relating with setting time, which is not setting time on its own, but we know that zeta is equal to one because this is the critical damp case. And that's basically it. So I'm going to change this into one because that didn't change. And yeah, I'm going to run it basically. The method states the same. But of course, we run into problems. And the reason behind that is we have, again, multiple values. I didn't do the best job in eliminating all the possible unwanted like solutions here. And we can see it because we have a negative p-value here, which we don't really want to have. So I'm going to basically copy and paste this part here. I'm going to change this into p-val being positive. If it's zero, I'm not really going to be interested in it. But if it's positive, I'm going to be interested in it. And you can see I'm not going to change anything. Maybe p-val should be 
uh, here. If you accidentally copy and paste this here, then pval should be the last one you're substituting in to. But other than that, we should be good to go if we run it twice. Now, of course, there's another problem. And uh, since we don't have TS, we cannot draw the settling time line here. And we can also not use settling time here because we don't uh, have such a definition. Um, yeah, other than that, we should be, I guess, good to go. Let's run it more, one more time. And oh, I didn't change it to three. So let me run three here. Um, oh, okay. So let's close everything down. Let's call run one, run two, and run three. Of course, I could create a better subplot and combine everything, but then I cannot copy and paste and stuff like that. So yeah, this is the way we're going to deal with stuff for now. So these two uh, solutions are the previous ones. Let us focus on this one here and then maybe compare it. So the question was asking us to design a critical damped closed loop. Now the value two here shows us that minus five and the origin pole collide at two here. And this is exactly the critical point that we're talking about. Because before that we have overdamped solutions because two real distinct values. At this exact point, we have a critical damped solution. From this point on, we will have complex conjugate solutions. Um, and the third pole is at exactly nine where we can see that there's a 4.5 times dominance factor here. And that's basically it. We have two poles at two, minus two, and one pole at minus nine, and that's the whole system. We don't have any overshoot because we don't have complex conjugate pairs. We have real uh, poles. And if you have real poles, you can just think about the cascade system where you have um, two divided by s plus two times two divided by s plus two times nine divided by s plus nine. That's basically what the system is. You can just have three first order systems uh, connected to each other in series, and that's basically the system here. If the first part doesn't uh, overshoot, the second part doesn't overshoot, third part doesn't overshoot, it will not overshoot. So if you have only real poles, your overshoot will be zero. So that's basically it. Now we can see that the settling time here is 3.0397. And you can see that if we would plug in four divided by two, it would give us two. But here we can see it's not the case. Now our settling time doesn't really work for critical damp systems. And in fact, for critical damp systems, we use 5.83 divided by omega n, which is two, which is the closer uh, model uh, that gives us almost three here, but it's a third order system. so. This still has effect on it, so therefore we have 30397. This is basically something out of scope that I've shown you here. It's not going to be 4 divided by something or here in this case. If zeta is equal to 1, you can use 5.83, but you don't really have to remember that. That's just uh, some trivial thing that I've uh, talked about now. Uh, we can only see that the overshoot is 0, and yeah, that's actually it. I can not comment more. On that. This is actually what I can say here is that this is actually the easiest root locus design problem on paper that you can uh, encounter. And the reason behind that is that on the real axis, the angle condition will always be satisfied because the real axis will always be a part of the root locus. So you don't really, really have to check out what the uh, angle condition is. You can just look for the distances, which is also, again, the easiest thing to calculate here. You can see that this distance is two, this distance is three, and then this distance here would be basically seven. You can just multiply them and you would get, I guess, 36. So two times, what was it again? Two times, three times seven, wasn't it? Am I correct? Two, and then three, and then seven. Forty-two. 
Um, wasn't that it? Actually, I'm not sure now. Mm. Two times three times seven. Absolute values, yeah, there's no problem there. So from five to two, three, this is two, make six. From nine to two, it's seven. Hmm. Whereas k value is 36, interesting. What is TS here? Or is that PKTS? Isn't it what I think it is? It is. Hmm. Why didn't I calculate it right away? I'm not quite sure. Oh, from this point. Oh, okay. From eight to two, it should be six. Okay, now it makes sense. Of course, not from nine. Of of course, yeah. Um, you can see that from origin to two, we have distance two. From five to two, we have distance three. So two times three, and then from the open loop pole eight to two, it makes six. So you get basically thirty six, and that's the value that you should end up in. Uh, when you're designing on the Rutokus uh, using pen and paper, basically. You can also use this point 0.9 here. That's also another way of doing it. Uh, there we go. Uh, if this is, for example, your design point, then you will have 9 as the distance from the origin and 4 from here and 1 from here. So you, get, you again get 36. So that's basically it. You can just design using any point that you want to design if you know what your point is going to be. Of course, you wouldn't know that this is going to be nine in closed loop. So yeah, that's another story, but uh, the critical damped controller design on the Rutokus, even mathematically is the simplest one because you don't have this trigonometric um, load on your shoulders. Well, let's actually run this again and see what happens in terms of comparison. If you compare them, we have three different cases. But they're basically the same. We hit even a lower value K, which is the critical point here. And therefore we have even lower overshoot and higher uh, friction or damping ratio. And the reason behind that is that this point is actually the critically damped point where the friction is at its ideal value. When you release the um, pendulum, it just stops at the equilibrium point, no overshoot whatsoever. From now on, if you will have lower K values, you will get overdamp solutions and it will just take more time basically to uh, reach the equilibrium point, which is not that much preferable. So we can see that we don't really have a settling time uh, line here because that was not the specification. So you should be able to look at the system and the root locus to conclude some stuff about the system's behavior in terms of zeta and omega. And of course, in terms of the K value, it's, it's quite important to be able to do that. So I would highly recommend you to use both the root locus method to design a controller and the polynomial method to design a controller and then try to see what's really going on for different specifications, for example, for the setting time. Now there's this last question here, which is oddly placed uh, here because we have the value four for the first question, value 2.5 and then critical damp. And then for some reason we're back with the setting time and it is 1.5. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this here, call it run four. And then also maybe uh, change the value here. And then maybe the figure here should be four. And technically, I should be done. So why is it here? So let's see. Now, if we calculate it, if we look at KVAL, for example, we're in a bit of a trouble. And here we can see that it might be due to eliminations, but I would highly suspect that uh, it's not, uh, that we ended up in an empty vector. So since we are eliminating stuff here, so you can look at 
sol, which is the solution, the origin solution, and you can see that there's no solution to that. So why could this be the case where we just did change the settling time specification and nothing else? So this is basically the set of equations that we're looking at. And if we try to solve this, we would basically see that 13 minus 5.333 should be P. So there's a value for P. So I guess 7.666 should be the value for P. And then we have this times 7.666 for this part here. And then plus omega n squared should be equal to 40. So if I enter this, I can see that it is slightly more than 40, 40.88. So if this is 40 and this is 40.88, it means that omega n squared should be negative 0.88. So if you think about this, it would directly give us a solution that looks like square root of 0.88 something, which is not that important, i. And you can see that the natural frequency is now imaginary, which means that this is actually not possible, or it is possible, but doesn't make sense. Now, if omega n is an imaginary value, when you have minus sigma times omega n plus minus i times omega n times square root of one minus theta squared, the square root of that, like this, then if you have something imaginary here, you would see, for example, it would be like this. And we would get rid of this part here and plus minus would be minus plus or again plus minus. This should be zeta by the way. Um, and yeah, this portion here would become basically uh, real. And this por portion is also going to be real. Therefore, we will end up in basically real distinct solutions. So what I'm trying to say is that if, if uh, you have basically uh, if you're violating the realness, if it's a complex value, omega n, then you will end up in basically a zeta greater than one, which uh, turns this whole thing into the overdamped case. So if you have this system, it would be overdamped. Now, I'm going to um, delete this real specification here because... If I'm going to do that, I will get the solution because I'm allowing omega n to be complex in this case. So run four. And then look at the solution. I get the solutions. Here we have some k values. We have some p values. And we have some omega n values where omega n is going to be basically uh, imaginary, as you can see here. So just for curiosity, because P is uh, basically positive, uh, it should be a stable closed loop. Um, I know what the value should be. So just out of curiosity, I'm going to take this value here. Now, at this point, K val, yeah, we have K val. So what I can do is I can just do something like uh, run four. Let me try it again. Do we have KVAL? Yep. So uh, I'm just going to choose KVAL equals KVAL 1 for some reason. Uh, so just choose one of the K values, which are identical, so it doesn't make sense uh, or it doesn't make a difference. We have settling time overshoot. So yeah, we don't have omega n value. So yeah, we could... Yeah, let's have omega n val equals omega n val 1, p val equals p val 1. Maybe I might also need the absolute value here. So we'll see. 
So that's run four. And if you look closer, first of all, we can see that, yeah, we are not on the positive root locus and K value was negative, of course. So K value is negative. Therefore, we should basically plot the negative root locus plot. So here, instead of having GS, we might have minus GS because that's the correct root locus to look at. There we go. And yeah, we're not on the setting timeline, as we can see. And furthermore, we can see that these two poles form the overdamped solution, whereas this one here is on the right half plane. And in fact, the settling, uh, the um, closing transfer function has a minus sign here. And if we look at the ZPK of it, you can see that we have a pole on the right half plane exactly at point 1618. Whereas the uh, poles 7.66 and 5.495 form a, an overdamped uh, pair, but the third one is on the right half plane. The negative coefficient controller is not that big of a problem other than uh, maybe needing a, another negative sign or an inverter to have uh, basically a positive response, but that's also not really possible. So you have to apply a negative reference to track the actual reference that you want to do uh, to track. But other than that, this system is not stable. And the problem here is not p-val at all because p-val is a positive value. So you can see that if you have uh, overdamped pole pairs, if you violate the real uh, property of omega n, then you might end up in stability issues. This also might have not been the case, but for that we have no choice but to stick with the positive root locus because the negative root locus will always be unstable because one pole starts from the origin and it tends to the right here. So therefore we have no luck in uh, using the negative root locus here because all of them are unstable. We should be on the positive root locus, but for that we cannot use negative k values. So we could just we get rid of negative values for this system specifically because we have a pole at the origin by default. So for negative values, the, the, the root locus goes to the right half plane. So negative values for this system specifically are not usable, are not practical because they end up in uh, unstable closed loops. But it might have been the case, even though we would have been on the root locus, negative root locus, we might uh, get away with uh, stability issues. But then again, this doesn't correspond to the setting time formula or uh, the model that we can uh, use here because it doesn't have anything to do with zeta and omega n if it's overdamped because there's no zeta here. Uh, it's greater than one. We are on the real axis and that's it. And omega n doesn't make sense because we have two real distinct poles and they will not be on top of the omega n value that we think of because it would it would be shifted to the left and right of the omega n uh, radius, basically. So um, this shows us the fact that 1.5 cannot be achieved with a p-type controller for this system because it becomes unstable. So you cannot uh, basically force a system to all the setting times uh, that you want because it has a certain limit to it. So, and the limit is basically determined by this critical damp point. If this is basically three, our model doesn't correspond to it, but this point is maybe this, the, the uh, fastest point that you can achieve using a P-type controller for this system. You cannot reach uh, something faster than that because one pole will be uh, here and the other one is here. So you can just meet uh, in the center here. And that's basically the point that you can achieve here in terms of setting time. But uh, then again, if theta is exactly equal to one, this point is not exactly uh, contained in our model. So what I can say the least is that somewhere here, we have basically the fastest setting time uh, and if you're curious, you can just use the a certain interval here for k. For example, you can use, uh, doesn't it show it? Yeah, 
uh, you can grid 0 to 100, actually not 0, maybe 36 to 100. You can just grid this here, use a fine grid and look for the setting time of the closed loop system and see which point is the fastest. It should be somewhere here where zeta is nearly 1, but not exactly 1, etc. So somewhere here is the fastest point. And you cannot force the system to be faster than that. So it cannot reach 1.5. As far as I can see, it should reach something like 2.2 seconds or something like that. Uh, we should look it up, but it is something around that. And we can just design that. So what can we do uh, in, if we still insist on having a faster closed loop? Well, we might need to change the controller. We might need a uh, more freedom uh, containing controller that could be, for example, the PD controller or PI controller, uh, or even a PID controller in order to try to force the system to be faster. Now in the PDF, you will see some, uh, line by line explanation. Hopefully, uh, I did a good job here. So you can basically understand it. Well, you have the set of equations, the solutions to them. And then also the closed loop transfer functions are given. Some pieces of code are given. This is the first solution that we ended up uh, when we were trying to uh, design for four seconds of settling time. Then we have this root locus plot, which is a manual plot uh, of the root locus using uh, the symbolic engine, I guess. Uh, and we can see we are on a certain settling time. So we are restricted to a certain real value for dominant poles. And the third one is somewhere here. So we've basically covered the same thing here. If it's 2.5, you can see that the real value is changed and therefore we have this desired uh, polynomial here. And uh, yeah, the closed loop here, the set of equations ended up being like this. When we've designed them, the solution looked like this and the transfer function looked like this. So yeah, you can see I have a line by line explanation. Hopefully that this will help you. And you can see we did have a better overshoot lower overshoot in terms of that lower k value. It was more to the left. This one also was more to the right. So the relative distance did uh, shrink a little bit, but yeah. If it's over that, you can see we have two poles on top of each other. And the third one was uh, at nine and the value was 36 to reach this. And this is exactly the amount of friction that is necessary to have the fastest reaching equilibrium point uh, design here. Now on uh, on the other solution for 1.5, we can see that both poles as the complex conjugate pair cannot exist on this line because we cannot reach uh, this line here. Maybe we can add, for example, a zero to the system so that we bend this whole thing to the left somehow. If that's going to be possible, uh, then we might end up in a faster solution. So we can try to design a PD controller, for example, to speed up the system a little bit. Uh, but that will be the discussion of the upcoming weeks. So in this uh, lesson, hopefully, we learned what zeta and omega n is specifically and how they serve us to try to comment on system behaviors based on their uh, step responses and their zeta and omega n values. And this information is important for the root locus space design, but we can also see that in terms of the polynomial methods, uh, we've seen how to apply the polynomial methods, but we also need the assistance of the zeta and omega values, the dominance factor, so that we can expect uh, we can evaluate the results if it's expected or if something is wrong. You can double check yourself if you know how to comment on systems. Hope that this was helpful for you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Other than that, uh, we will see each other next week, same day, same hour.